Hello everyone, welcome. This is ActInf live stream number 51.1. We are in the second discussion of our this paper, Canonical Neural Networks Perform Active Inference. Welcome to the Active Inference Institute. We're a participatory online institute that is communicating, learning, and practicing applied active inference. You can find us on this slide, and this is recorded in an archived live stream. So please provide us feedback so we can improve our work. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome and we'll follow good video etiquette for live streams. Head over to activeinference.org to learn more about the Institute and how to participate in projects and learning groups. All right, we're in active stream number 51.1 and having our first non solo discussion on this paper, Canonical Neural Networks Perform Active Inference, and really appreciative, Takuya, that you've joined today. It's going to be a great discussion. We'll begin with introductions. I'll say hello, and then please just jump in however you'd like, and we can start by setting some context. So I'm Daniel. I'm a researcher in California, and I was interested in this paper because we've been talking a lot about active inference from a variety of different perspectives, from the more fundamental math and physics to some applications, philosophy, embodiment, all these really interesting threads. And this paper seems to make a really clear, meaningful contribution and connection by connecting active inference entities and this approach of modeling to neural networks, which are in daily use globally. So thought it was a fascinating connection and really appreciate that we can talk about this today. So to you and welcome. Go for it, Takuya, however you'd like to introduce and say hello. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Takuya Isomura, a neuroscientist in Riken Brain Science Institute in Japan. Uh, I'm particularly interested in you know, universal characterization of a neural network and brain using mathematical techniques. So uh, this work, I believe, uh, important as a link between you know, uh, active inference aspect, Bayesian inference aspect, aspect of the brain and the dynamical system aspect of uh, the neural network. So uh, I'm very happy to join this discussion session. Thank you for the invitation. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you <laughs> as well. Um, the first thing you added, the universal characterization of neural networks. Mm. What is the universal characterization of neural networks? Why is it being pursued in this area of research? So as a narrow sense, uh, my uh, aim, main aim of this paper is that, so, you know, uh, people people use active inference formalization uh, to characterize uh, uh, brain activity, uh, behavior, so on, so on, but uh, which, would be different from a conventional neural network. So there is a, a class of problem uh, which is associated with a con uh, conventional neural network. And it is not very clear whether uh, all characterization of conventional neural network can be explained by active inference free energy principle or not. So here, universal characterization means that characterization of every aspect of conventional neural network, uh, which is a, a kind of dynamical system derived uh, as the association between a physiological phenomena and uh, so simple mathematical uh, formula using typically using differential equations. As the broad sense, I think a uh, universal characterization means that, well, uh, it is a characterization of brain intelligence, but it's a big picture. And uh, what uh, the 
paper, particularly address is uh, only uh, one as aspect of the, the full picture. All right. So it'll be great to pull back to really understand what synthesis is happening. So yeah. I'm going to ask what makes a neural network model a neural network model and what makes an active inference model an active inference model? Is this synthesis and connection you've made true because of what? Because of, you know, basically what we showed is the, the mathematical equivalence between the formulation of uh, canonical neural networks and the formulation of uh, active inference in the sense that we showed that uh, a class of neural network uh, can be characterized by a minimization of some biologically plausible cost function. And we show that uh, that cost function can be read as uh, 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 class uh, uh, variational Bayesian inference and a particular class of uh, genetic model uh, in terms of uh, well-known partially observable non-cognition process. All right. Shall we perhaps walk through some of the sections of the paper? Mm -hmm. It would be awesome just for each of these sections, maybe the numbered and the lettered sections, what does the section aim to show and why was it there in the paper? Hmm. So, uh, yeah, briefly, so it's a, it's an overview, right? Uh, so yeah, briefly, so first we, uh, introduce, uh, so the main, main issue, main problem of our interest, uh, which is a relationship to which is that, so we, we try to make a formal link between neural network and active inference. That's a, that's the main problem, uh, background. Uh, and then we first formulate, formulate, uh, the equivalence, mathematical equivalence in a very broad manner. So in the uh, first section in result, uh, we uh, formulate uh, the the relationship using a uh, uh, complete class theorem, which is a well-known uh, statistical theorem uh, proposed very long time ago. And uh, we using that, we, we link uh, a general form of neural network with uh, a general form of uh, variational Bayesian inference. But uh, a problem is that uh, this characterization does not address a specific form of generative model, uh, which is uh, crucial to characterize, you know, uh, a specific, specific model, specific neural network dynamics. So uh, in the following, uh, sections, we uh, characterize uh, the problem using POMDP or partially observable remark conditional process and uh, link uh, that uh, model with a particular class of uh, canonical neural network. And then uh, we simulated, uh, we, we use the simulation to, to uh, uh, corroborate uh, that property uh, in terms of some maze tasks. All right. Thank you for this. Could we talk about the complete class theorem? So what is the scope of the complete class theorem? And why was it the relevant set of the neural networks to pursue or the right way to frame it? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that. So I like uh, the the slide you showed <laughs> in the last week's uh, video. So uh, complete cross theorem basically indicates uh, the relationship between uh, some class of decision rule and Bayesian inference. Uh, 
uh, here a crucial keyword is uh, uh, a domiciliary or a domiciliary decision rule, which, which is a rule uh, which is uh, as same as uh, as as good as other uh, decision rules, or uh, at least in a uh, at the one point uh, better than other decision rule. So, yeah, simply speaking, admissibility indicate uh, in some sense it is the best uh, rule uh, for some aspect. And usually we characterize such a goodness using a cost function, loss function, or risk function. And here, what we uh, did is uh, some uh, we. we is uh, establish some association with this this type of loss function or risk function with uh, a function of a canonical neural network, uh, which is we call cost function or biologically plausible cost function for neural network. So our assumption is that a neural network minimize cost function. So if it achieves the minimization and it is a obviously uh, achieve some sort of optimality. So we can say it is admissible with respect to that cost function. So the beauty of uh, complete cross theorem is that uh, if uh, we if we find uh, some admissible decision, rule, then automatically we can say that it is based Bayesian inference in terms of in terms of some Bayesian cost function with a uh, generative model or prior beliefs. So uh, this uh, complete crest theorem is uh, crucial as a, you know, abstract uh, characterization of the relationship between conventional neural network architecture dynamics and uh, uh, variational Bayesian inference. All right. Thank you. Um, what does it mean when you said it was biologically plausible of a loss function? Uh, we, the term is a little bit arbitrary because so in this paper, we uh, mean by uh, biological plausibility uh, by, by, you know, the in the sense that uh, this neural network model uh, can be derived from realistic neural model uh, through some approximation. And uh, so here, biological plausibility uh, suggests or means, you know, uh, plausibility as a neural model or synaptic plasticity model. And uh, if, if this cost function, loss function can derive uh, such a plausible Algorithm, then uh, we can say that uh, this cost function is very plausible. So, what is the distinction between those neural and synaptic components in the loss function, or what equation to look at? Uh, you mean distinction between neural dynamics and synaptic? Yeah. What is the distinction between them, and how is it represented in the equations? Uh, Okay, uh, basically neural activity equation means a, a differential equation about a variable uh, that represents uh, firing intensity or uh, some sort of so, uh, variables associated with the uh, neural, neural firing. On the other hand, uh, synaptic plasticity equation means uh, an update rule about the synaptic weights or synaptic strengths, uh, which is a, a connection between two neurons. And the uh, uh, beauty of uh, this formulation uh, proposed in this paper is that uh, we characterize both uh, neural activity equation and synaptic plasticity equations in terms of, uh, uh, well, uh, gradient descent on a same cost function, uh, common cost function. So, uh, we can, we can say that if we uh, consider the, uh, 
partial derivative of some cost function with respect to near activity, then it derives a uh, uh, gradient descent rule about uh, activity, near activity, while if we consider a partial derivative of cost function L with respect to synaptic weight, then we derive a synaptic plasticity rule. Are those the only two aspects of a neural network or why are those the two key aspects? Uh, it is a main character. I, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a main uh, body of the neural activity. If we, we, we consider some uh, inference running or action uh, exhibit by neural network uh, in the sense that uh, neural activity correspond to fast dynamics, fast gradient uh, dynamics. And uh, while uh, synaptic plasticity indicates slow dynamics that minimize uh, risk function and cost function. But in general, we can consider any, any aspect, any variables associated with neural network. For example, uh, at least what we show in the paper is that uh, any free parameter which may be associated with a uh, firing threshold. Or uh, although we don't discuss in this paper, it would be possible to add other uh, variables related to neural network. For example, we here we ignored uh, contribution of Gliar factor, uh, but uh, it will be possible to add uh, the Gliar factor in this formulation or any other aspect of biological neural network. Mm. That's very interesting. And it speaks also to a, genera uh, a general separation of time scales. Mm. For example, in different multi scale systems or in the renormalization group, where it's describing some minimal multi time scale system where the faster time scale can be seen as perception like right. and the slower time scale can be seen as more learning like and then in some hierarchical model what's learning of one time scale can be perceptual for a slower time scale so it's a very nice generalization Are there any examples of decision rules that will help us think about the action components of what the neural network is doing? Because it may be more familiar to think about digit characterization and image classification, some kind of classical tasks for neural networks. But how does the decision rule play out in the context of neural networks? Uh, okay. So, uh, in this paper, we basically assume a closed loop, uh, so comprising a neural network part and environmental part. So neuron receives sensory input from environment and the feed, uh, uh, provides some feedback to the environment. So, uh, in, yeah. Even with the example of digit uh, uh, classification, we can say that uh, output correspond to uh, classifier uh, classification output, which is a kind of decision rule. More relevant uh, example would be, for example, controlling uh, agent like a robot control or any kind of uh, controlling or decision making tasks. For example, when we uh, encounter some uh, choice task, we need to output either, for example, left or right or something. Uh, any kind of such uh, decisions uh, can be associated with the admissibility or admissible decision rule. So what would an example of an inadmissible or admissible strategy be in the 
decision making task? Uh, admissibility usually characterized by loss function or risk function. So, uh, if so, here in admissibility indicate that uh, this there is uh, another decision rule which is uh, at least one point uh, better than uh, the, the 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 forecast. Uh, uh, decision rule. So, yeah, simply speaking, uh, in adopticity indicate that it that that uh, decision rule is not better, uh, not not good, <laughs> uh, relatively. But let's just say our decision rule is we always turn right. Is that an example of a decision rule? Because there might be settings where that is strictly effective and the simplest rule mm -hmm. whereas there's other settings where that's going to be tragic so what does it mean to be admissible for an agent in light of different environmental contexts that's a that's an interesting point so uh even with even such a so too much sim simpl simplified rule uh, it it can be admissible under some particular situation, particular loss function. For example, uh, the rule that uh, always turn right, maybe, maybe the best <laughs> under some, some situation, right? So, uh, the, 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 the relationship of admissibility or inadmissibility depends on both Asian agent characteristic and the environmental characteristic. What aspects of the environment? Uh, for example, for example, if the, the decision rule matches the, the structure, architecture of uh, environment, then, you know, maybe that, that decision always turn right, uh, achieve the shortest path, right? Under some situation, some environment. How does this admissibility help us think about like overfitting? And how does it help us think about the way that different practices are used for neural networks to prevent them from being overfit in practice? Well, well, uh, strictly, uh, admissibility is characterized with the, the Bayesian risk. Uh, so we are in a, uh, we, we cannot observe a hidden state of the, the environment. Uh, only we can observe, uh, is uh, a part of the entire uh, universe. So uh, the question is, uh, an important uh, question is, uh, what is the best choice under uh, such a, a limited, limited information, limited, uh, uh, yeah, information. So uh, this uh, Bayesian list idea or admissibility or uh, complete crest theorem, uh, 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 tell us that so you know well-known Beijing only the well-known uh, Beijing Beijing uh, framework uh, achieved the, the admissive admissibility admissible decision which means that uh, uh, in, in this aspect Beijing uh, optimization is uh, give us a best best choice strategy otherwise uh we overfit or uh on find the uh, would find the the you know suboptimal solution so it's a nice nice association nice uh, linkage between the decision what is a good decision about the decision and the uh, more established uh, statistical inference page and inference framework Thank you. That's very helpful. So 
we're reducing our uncertainty and risk about hidden states in the environment. So in the special case where the entire environment is observable without error, like a chess game, mm -hmm. then there's an equivalence between calculation of risk or loss on observables or on hidden states, but they're not really hidden, but they are environmental states. Whereas any amount of uncertainty in the mapping between observations and hidden states, which is usually shown as A in the partially observable Markov decision process, any amount of uncertainty about unobserved or partially observed environmental states enables you to fit your uncertainty optimally about that hidden state and fit that uncertainty simply with a gradient descent. And by doing so, you don't overfit a model of observables, hmm. which might be the fallacy or the issue with simply doing descriptive statistics. You might get an infinitely small variance with a frequentist estimate because you have 100,000 data points. So the variance from a descriptive statistics perspective might be very small. Uh -huh. I think it speaks very much to why neural networks are useful in practice from training with limited data sets, because that's an empirical observation that they don't entirely overfit, but also I'm sure there's ways to construct them that are overfit. Yeah. Overfit would occur if we uh, select some uh, sub optimal prior beliefs, for example. Well, I, I'm not sure if it's is a overfit in the sense what you mentioned, because uh, if we select some prior belief, then the Bayesian function itself changes and the uh, neural network uh, try to fit to that cost function. So cost function minimization would be achieved even at uh, even such a situation, but that solution is not good uh, for our, you know, original purpose. That's a tricky part. Yeah, that um, is reminiscent of some discussions we've had discussing like driving off a cliff or blowing up is also reducing free energy. Like dropping off a building reduces your potential energy. Mm -hmm. And so there are potentially decision-making or strategic trajectories that do for some time horizon minimize free energy. Yeah. Perhaps even, or maybe even guaranteed better than some longer time horizon. Because if the short-term strategies were somehow better than the long-term horizon, it would be difficult to imagine because the long-term horizon would be at least as good as a short-term strategy. So that speaks to the challenges of planning in action. So how is planning addressed in modern neural networks? And how does this work help us think about that? uh that's another very important aspect so uh first i have to say that uh this framework addresses the uh, planning aspect but that uh, that planning is not necessarily the 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 optimal or the optimal solution in the sense that what we uh interested in is uh optimization or planning under a uh, limited uh, structure the uh, the structure is characterized by uh, here biological plausible two layer neural networks so uh yeah planning occurred by an um, association between uh, risk in the future and the uh, decision our decision in the past 
here we model that aspect using a uh, uh, delayed modulation of synaptic plasticity uh, mediated by some neuromodulator or uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, th this is the model. This is model as uh, sorry for <laughs> uh, this is model as a uh, uh, the product of the the risk factor and the uh, uh, heavy product uh, holding the 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 cost function neural network cost function. All right. I'm going to ask a great question from the chat, and then we'll look at the figures a little closer. So ML Don wrote, a question stuck in my mind for a long time. Could you please put it to rest? Do we need to have knowledge about all states, possible actions, and sensory inputs for active inference? Well, uh... You mean if you seek the exact solution, exact uh, optimal solution, then maybe more information uh, would help you to find that. But under some uh, model, uh, generative model, uh, under some uh, ideal ideal uh, assumption, then uh, the all all variables is not necessary to achieve. The, the, the optimal optimal solution. I know that I'm not sure if I correctly answer your point. So, just to restate it, of course, knowing all the states, possible actions, and sensory inputs, it's not a bad thing. Worst case, there's some computational complexity trade offs, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. problem becomes fully statable. But I think ML Don is asking about cases where you don't know all of the state spaces or potentially even the dimensionality or the semantics uh -huh. of hidden states, active states, sensory inputs, and why not even add cognitive states? So in not just partially observed, but partially known state spaces, how are these addressed in neural networks and how does active inference help us think about it? Uh, okay. I, I think uh, the question is about the, how can we separate those uh, states or uh, sensory function uh, internal external how can we separate not just in principle have these states be separated but deal with the fact that some of these states we might have good knowledge on and some states like the hidden states we might not even know like we mm -hmm. don't know the dimensionality of the cause vector in ah, the world. I see. Uh, for example, in terms of dimensionality, uh, there is a statistical technique to estimate uh, the dimensionality, for example, uh, various uh, information criteria, like IK information criteria, base information criteria, all of them uh, try to infer or estimate a uh, uh, plausible dimensionality about the experimental, uh, environmental hidden uh, states. So so there is an analogy with those information criteria and the variational free energy minimization. So uh, with variational free energy minimization we can we can identify the plausible plausible model structure uh, which uh, in principle involves the dimensionality aspect. But uh, in terms of neural network, uh, in this paper, we don't uh, carefully consider about the dimensionality optimization because we 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 first define the the number of neuron 
and uh, don't change uh, during the training. But uh, in principle, we can consider the change in the number of neurons, which is uh, associated with the, the, for example, neurogenesis, adult neurogenesis or development during the developmental stage. That will be an important uh, extension of this 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 direction. That's very interesting. Here's um, a remark. Well, one note is equation one summarizes a lot of what you've been describing. There's a parallelism or a concordance being drawn between the loss function of neural mm -hmm. networks and the variational free energy of the parameterized model um, there. So to come back to these processes that influence learning, which we could think of as the neural network becoming more fit from a loss function perspective or the variational Bayesian partially observable Markov decision process entity generative model becoming better at doing what it does. So there's the firing rate on the neural network side, the synaptic plasticity at a slower time scale, which we discussed a little earlier. And then now there's a third time scale with the birth and death of new cells and maybe uh -huh. even new layers. And that kind of multi-scale temporal structuring is not intrinsic to the Bayes graph. To represent multiple nested time scales in a Bayes graph in the active inference literature, it's more common to make a hierarchically nested model. Right. And just say that the time um, handling on one level is happening more rapidly with respect to clock time than deeper nested, slower models. Whereas the neural formulation allows us to deal with multiple ongoing timescales without appealing to hierarchical nesting, which is a very important feature. Hmm. Well, yeah, both both directions will be possible. So without hierarchical modeling or with hierarchical modeling. So even with hierarchical modeling, uh, the the optimization of uh, dimensionality should be possible or would be possible. But so in other uh, direction so we can consider that uh, a population of uh, neural models so one has a single layer another has a two layers third, uh, three layers four, four layers and uh, consider the probability or plausibility of a network architecture uh, associated with the 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 performance or uh, cost function minimization under a particular uh, environment, uh, which is in principle uh, have the same uh, computational architecture with the 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 hierarchical uh, Bayesian model. Very interesting. Yes, perhaps I over generalized or speculated because I thought about how one could have a 100 time step POMDP that mm. also performs multi-scale behavior, potentially extremely wastefully, but at least it could in principle. Mm. And similarly, within a neuron, there could be another neural network mm. or some other structure approximated by that. So they almost both enable hierarchical and non-hierarchical modeling as you described 
but in very different ways that lead to very different implementations. Mm. Yes. I think this brings us to the topic of forward and reverse engineering. So you talked a lot about reverse engineering. Yeah. What is reverse engineering and what is forward engineering and what has been done in these areas of engineering? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert of you know, reverse engineering in the broad sense, but uh, uh, I believe that uh, reverse here means a uh, uh, characterization of the blueprint of the, some, some you know device or machine from data observable information like uh, activity uh, or uh, action behavior of some agent. Right. So goal is the identification of the blueprint. Uh, and uh, crucially here, blueprint correspond to generative model because once we define generative model, we can derive variational free energy, uh, algorithm, running algorithm, inference algorithm, and any behavior of agent. So here reverse uh, means that uh, we first observe some activity of agent and its mechanism is still unknown for us but uh, we can we can uh, estimate its mechanism uh, using uh, that activity uh, by by identifying the most plausible uh, uh, generative model uh, which uh, can minimize some cost function uh, or or risk function uh, uh, when we fit the data to the, the the model the model so on the other hand forward engineering would be um, um, more of a mainstream uh, way first define model a blueprint a uh, genetic model then uh, derive uh, everything uh, including variational free energy functional uh, running inference algorithms uh, behavior action action uh, selection algorithm So by reverse engineering neural networks, we're observing some already parameterized neural network and then fitting a POMDP to it. To what extent is it possible to take a given POMDP and create a neural network that performs that inference? Uh, okay. In this paper, uh, or in the following uh, paper, what we consider is a strategy that we, we first fit uh, empirical data, for example, neural response data, to a, a biologically plausible canonical neural network model, which is a, which is similar to a conventional model fitting approach where we have a uh, differential equation and data and uh, fit data to the differential equation to uh, explain the, the the behavior uh, in the with the minimal uh, prediction so now a virtue of this uh, framework we established is that uh, we can transform, we can naturally transform such a neural network architecture uh, with the uh, well-known partially observable Markov decision process architecture because uh, for any a kind of canonical neural network, there is a cost function. Uh, so we, we, we derive cost function from neural activity equation. Uh, which is uh, opposite uh, 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 with the, uh, the conventional way we first define cost function derived uh, algorithm. And then we use the formal, uh, the formal 
uh, equivalence between neural network cost function and variational free energy. And so now transform the neural network architecture to a Bayesian model architecture. And it, once we uh, characterize variational free energy, there should be um, some some generative model that that define the, the that that variational free energy functional. So, uh, for in particular, this this in this example, uh, canonical neural network uh, nicely correspond to well known uh, a, a class of well known partially observed man, man condition process. So, uh, by using this this uh, procedure, we uh, identify uh, a plausible home DP uh, architecture, which is uh, corresp which correspond to uh, observed uh, neural activity data. Oh. Well, let's stay on this last point. So mm -hmm. after all those transformations, first the measurements of neurons, mm -hmm. using that data to fit the neural network, and then by virtue of the relationships unpacked in the paper, transforming the neural network in the left side of figure one into a particular form of the POMDP. So first, what are the constraints on that form of the POMDP? Is this a little corner of model space or what are the space of acceptable POMDPs? Uh, that totally depends on what kind of neural network model you are considering. So, uh, for example, in this paper, we discuss about a particular class of POMDP that uh, in which uh, each state takes either zero or one. So it's a very restricted <laughs> compared to the general form of uh, home DP, but uh, we have a, we, we consider a factorization. So in the sense that although each state takes either zero or one, but uh, we consider a vector of observation, a vector of hidden state where each uh, element uh, correspond to uh, one, one, you know, single one hot vector. But uh, right. as an entire state, it can ex uh, represent a uh, high dimensional uh, discrete state space. And uh, this architecture nicely correspond to neural network uh, architecture because usually each neuron takes either zero or one or uh, some value, continuous variable between uh, zero and one. So uh, we use this association uh, to characterize a particular home DP which correspond to neural networks. And uh, this follows uh, a particular uh, mean field approximation, approximation or approximation in generative model because uh, we associate a post posterior belief in this particular POMDP with the, the, the neural activity, which means that uh, posterior of action also have a factorization architecture in the sense that we don't uh, we don't uh, fully consider about the 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 second order statistics between neuron one's activity and neuron two activity, which is outside of this formalism. So each each neuron neural each neuron's activity correspond to uh uh posterior expectation about the particular uh, element uh, of the state. And we don't consider the, the, the 
joint probability, joint posterior probability of all states. So although this is a limit limitation of uh, as we, we see this as a uh, class of uh, C as a Bayesian inference, but uh, otherwise, for example, we can consider any recurrent network architecture uh, which correspond to a state of transition matrix. And uh, it will be possible to extend this architecture to higher count structure in the sense that uh, it is straightforward to consider a tree structure or any kind of higher car structure by assuming that some neuron connect to other neuron but not connect to uh, other neuron. So uh, this is same as considering the higher car structure in general. Thanks. That's very interesting. It's commonly remarked in the Bayes graphs that they represent the connections amongst random variables, and there's a relationship between their computability and their sparsity. The sparsity structure, as in which variables do or do not influence each other, makes the problem tractable through factorization and just kind of conceptually like if every one of a thousand variables or an unknown number of large variables if it was all by all the number of parameters to fit on that connectivity matrix would be very high so statistical mm -hmm. power would be very low for any given edge whereas the more and more constrained you make the connectivity of the variables the more statistical power you have to resolve or kind of spend on fitting those edges like in a structural equation mm -hmm. but you might be losing sight of the unknown unknowns by constraining yourself to a very limited or fallacious topology of the variables so there's this kind of structure learning statistical inference question in the Bayes graphs then on the neural side from the biological, much of neuroscience is about understanding how the firing rate, connectivity patterns, and other factors, how the structure of those neural systems and their function, like form and function, enable adequate inference and inference on action. Mm -hmm. So it's like in both of those areas, or really mm -hmm. like in neural network, artificial and neural networks, mm -hmm. and in variational bays, the discussion is about how the structure and the fine tuning work together to generate function mm -hmm. and about some of the statistical or um, biological challenges of balancing different needs while also constraining the cost in terms of materials and uh, biometabolism. So it's a very rich intersection that is being explored here. If these models can really be moving back and forth. In, in the sense that uh, back and forth moving back and forth like there's some uh, imprint of the model that is implementation independent or like some interlingua or some semantics or compatibility i don't really know i mean that's something we can explore is like what is it that is such that one could forward engineer and then mm -hmm. reverse engineer mm -hmm. and have like kind of an expectation maximization between these two areas. So what is it that's being sought? Uh, yes, the, the important point. So 
Yeah, for example, a virtue of this relationship is that we can use the knowledge of uh, Bayesian inference to explain neural activity and neural dynamics, which is crucial because uh, people often say that uh, characterization, character, characterizing neural dynamics is uh, not straightforward. Uh, we we may we may obtain some solution of neural net dynamics, but the uh, the meaning of that uh, dynamics uh, in terms of functional aspect is very unclear. We don't know the meaning of connective e uh, strengths, uh, matrices, and what is the meaning of uh, the threshold factor, and so on, so on. Those are uh, derived as the derived from the you know the modeling the physiological phenomena, but uh, it is not necessary to have a clear linkage to a uh, functional explanation fun so explanation of function of the brain but once we transform uh, translate this uh, dynamics into a bayesian inference then uh, we can explain uh, every uh, functional aspect of the the neural network dynamics architecture in terms of uh, where established uh, bayesian inference under a particular class of Bayesian model, in this case, PomDP model. So now uh, it turns out that uh, synaptic strengths correspond to A matrix, B matrix, which are very established, uh, the clear meaning. So yeah, this is useful to explain neural neuro synaptic uh, property uh, in terms of uh, the well established statistics. Uh, also, for uh, the people in the active inference side, it would, be, it would be helpful to understand the neuronal substrate about a particular uh, active inference modeling model. So, uh, so I think it's related to forward modeling. Uh, but uh, finally, to discuss with the discuss about the, the vertical substrate of that forward uh, model, we need to address uh, the neural network uh, architecture uh, the substrate property. So, uh, in that case. Uh, we can transform a particular uh, PomDP Bayesian modeling uh, to a neural network architecture using this relationship and then get a prediction about the substrate. So if we have uh, this Bayesian model, this, this, this particular quantity in this model should be would be possible using this. Oh, you just sorry. Repeat? oh, it's all good. Can you just repeat the last like 20 seconds? Uh, yes. So uh, in the last part I mentioned about the four, uh, so first we define the Bayesian model and then can uh, predict what is the neuronal substrate that correspond to as that the particular Bayesian model. So this would be useful to so identify the biological uh, you know, quantities uh, that, that correspond to a quantity in, in Bayesian inference. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well, there's a lot there it makes me think about the differences of implementation and heuristics in the computational setting which is often in the extreme disembodied and the biological setting which is in the extreme entirely embodied and for a given generative model mm. 
the kinds of computational heuristics that can be applied include a whole host of different strategies, ranging from sampling to tree exploration and branching to paralyzing the data architecture and all these other kinds of disparate strategies um, and software packages and implementations. But on the biological side, what is needed is something that's very simple, mm. but also very inscrutable, which is a given pattern of interactions Mm. must embody that calculation. Mm. So that might mean that it can add three digit numbers, but it can't add two digit numbers under some constraints. Mm. But what isn't accessible to that kind of morphological, biological, or like form and functional computing, what's not accessible are the tree branching, the database mm. decentralization, like they're a different set of heuristics, right? but they're both very useful when we're thinking about making sentient artifacts or benefiting simply from the explainability across both sides of this figure. Yeah. So you now address an important uh, point. So honestly, uh, it is very non-trivial whether uh, there is a, a corresponding biological architecture for any given uh, Bayesian architecture. I, I believe it is impossible to design biological architecture to correspond to arbitrary Bayesian architecture. So. Only a limited uh, aspect of Bayesian uh, model can be implemented in a vertical plausible manner. And uh, that, that point is crucial as a characterization of biological network, biological brain, right? Yeah, wow. Well, just to kind of touch again on this forward and reverse engineering, for a given POMDP, if we're willing to compose it within a certain class, which might be quite general still, but mm. some class of POMDP as written on the paper, mm. we may be able to have a neural network architecture that would be very amenable to deep learning, low energy computing, pre-training, various features. And then on the other side, for a given artificial neural network that we come across in the wild, or a model of neural dynamics that we fit using a neural network model, so something in a neuroscience laboratory, that model can have interpretability corresponding to the variables of a given POMDP. And just to kind of give one more point on how that's going deeper than, for example, statistical parametric mapping, SPM. So let's just assume that the neural network we're dealing with is fit from brain data from some lucky ant. Right now, what would be possible or prior to this line of work or without this line of work, one could fit a neural dynamics model and then do all kinds of analyses like power analyses on the different frequency spectra and say, um, look at the average firing rate or the correlation co coefficients of firing rate. So fit the firing rates and the synaptic plasticities and, and store all that data. And then hmm. we could just pick a POMDP that we've seen in the literature without any reference to the neural network and optimize the POMDP. And then we could say, well, it turns out that when the POMDP um, O is high, 
there's increased theta power in this firing pattern. So okay. it's like comparing the descriptive statistics from okay. the neural model to the descriptive summary statistics of the POMDP decision-making model. However, with this formal connection, there is actually an interpretability to the unobserved neural states, which are what are being inferred from the fMRI measurement, from the EEG measurements and so on. Those underlying variables have a specific interpretability in relationship to the structure of the POMDP. Yeah. Right, so yeah, that's also a very interesting, important uh, aspect. So as you said, uh, the, what you said is, uh, more, I, I think conventional, more conventional uh, strategy and uh, it, it is also formally related to model comparison aspect. So we usually think various Bayesian modeling and uh, identify or select what is the you know best uh, model to explain the uh, given data. And uh, this reverse engineering idea involves such a model comparison aspect in the sense that uh, we we try to find the model with the best, best explainability, which should be have the identical <laughs> functional, <laughs> right? So, so we we directly addresses the the, the exact same <laughs> uh, cost function architecture using the, the transformation, natural transformation. So uh, it should be up to uh, explain the neural data in the Bayesian sense. Yeah, one can imagine how that would transform the way that current neuroimaging studies and technologies describe what it is about the measurement that provides information about mm -hmm. the cognitive model. So mm -hmm. to give another related example, let's just say a person was wearing a EEG headset okay. oh. and a previous study had shown that increased alpha band activity was associated with this behavior. That's comparing a descriptive statistic of the observations of the sensor and correlating the summarized observable to some other variable like anxiety or performance on a behavior. Mm. In contrast, an unobserved variable in this setting, the actual underlying neural state is being correlated to some semantic generative model component. So it's no longer necessarily that any single frequency band would be associated more or less with a given outcome, but it's actually some hidden state variability which gains the interpretability across this transformation, which is a subtle point, but it speaks to how broadly the equivalence would reinterpret empirical neuroimaging results, as well as a variety of artificial neural network experiments and diagnostics where people do lesion studies and double knockouts on artificial neural networks. So anywhere where somebody with awareness sees that a neural network, artificial or biological, is having summary features described and correlated to something that's more semantic mm -hmm. in a quest for meaning, 
may now have a different approach that involves formalizing the model explicitly in terms of unobserved hidden stage, states with a cost function akin to a variational free energy minimizing risk bounding surprise on the unobservables. So even though the unobservables were, were modeled in a sense in the other conventional strategy, like neural activity is a variable in fMRI experiments. It's underlying the bold signal. Yet this formalism concordance is a more coherent and powerful connection. Yeah, uh, I, I, I believe so. So uh, you now address this very important point. So it's first to, to, to address that. So we need to clarify about the, what is the problem uh, considered here? So this is a, a problem, so-called meta uh problem in the sense that researchers try to infer or estimate uh, neural activity or brain activity, which infer the external world uh, dynamics. Right, so neuron or brain infer environment, and we researcher infer brain activity. So there are the two step of Bayesian <laughs> inference uh, processes. So this sort of meta Bayesian uh, problem is quite uh, tricky, uh, intractable, uh, because uh, sometimes uh, so probability uh, so sometimes random variable uh, becomes a uh, posterior belief uh, about <laughs> other aspect so uh i i think there is some established approach about meta vision but uh, uh, this is this paper provides some alternative in the sense that we separate uh, two problem uh, by by saying that here, uh, what we infer is a uh, simply a neural network model or neural network dynamics, which is shown in the right, left hand side of this, this figure. So we, we fit the data to conventional neural network uh, model, which is a simple differential equation. But thanks to this formal equivalence between neural network dynamics and the uh, home DB uh, behavior, then we can transform the, the resulting uh, neural network architecture or dynamics into the, the Bayesian inference in, a, in some sense post hoc manner. So we, we nicely avoid the, the uh, directory addressing the, the meta Bayesian problem, but uh, obtain the same kind of solution. In that sense, yes, uh, with uh, combining with uh, brain activity recording like a EEG or imaging, uh, yeah, we can, we can design, we can, we can uh, estimate a plausible neural network model uh, in the left hand side and can uh, transform that to a Home DP in the right hand side. Right. Awesome. I'm going to show an image and ask a question from Dave in the chat. So Dave made this image. It's the right side of figure one that we've just been looking at with the variational Bayesian formation. And he wrote the arc shown as impinging on the S self arc. Is this intentional? If so, it could represent tuning or modulation of the feedback of S into itself. So, do you have a thought on this? Uh, it's intentional, yes. Uh, I think it's uh, related to the usual uh, formulation of 
of PongDB architecture and uh, active inference uh, context in the sense that you know, our decision or policy uh, uh, in the usual setting modify uh, the state transition matrix uh, B matrix, right? So uh, here delta is an alternative of policy uh, of agent. So basically B delta indicates a uh, uh, state transition matrix under a particular decision uh, which uh, agent made. So in that sense, uh, what uh, the agent changes is the uh, state transition matrix, not the uh, state itself directly. That's why we uh, use this, this uh, illustration. Awesome. Very subtle but important point, which is when we look at the classical POMDP formulation. So here we'll look at a version shown in figure two. I'll just bring just figure two in. Um, could you describe what you just did about the role of the B matrix in influencing how hidden states change and how that is where our policies have impact. And also, please, how do the top and the bottom of figure two differ? Mm. Okay, so in the in the usual formulation uh, under uh, active inference uh, with a POMDP structure, so we first consider a uh, uh the 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 pre prior preference and uh, the depending on the prior preference we uh, compute the the expect free energy and uh, its minimization provides the policy and the the policy modulate uh the up state transition so now in the upper layer uh, we instead use the delta, which is the uh, action of the agent. So here, action or decision was made uh, for each time step. So that uh, unlike the conventional formulation, uh, uh, we, we have a sequence of uh, delta and for each time step, delta modulate the state transition matrix B. So B is a matrix that uh, transform uh, S hidden state in the previous step to the uh, S in the current time step. And uh, its modulation indicate that uh, under uh, a specific uh, decision rule, uh, for example, if this S indicate my our uh, position in the, the virtual environment uh, with the goal decision, our position moved forward. Or if we choose the uh, uh, no goal uh, decision, then it, it unchanged. Uh, so the, such, such a uh, modulation of, of, of state transition was made uh, by choosing delta. And uh, the lower part uh, correspond to uh, Bayesian inference made by um, Bayesian agent. So basically, uh, there is a symmetry uh, between upper part and the uh, lower part uh, because uh, we assume that uh, this Bayesian agent has a, a, a plausible uh, guarantee model, uh, which uh, nicely correspond to a given environment defined in the above uh, part, uh, upper part in this figure. But uh, one interesting uh, thing, so asymmetry, is that uh, to model this particular canonical neural network, uh, we don't consider uh, uh, an arrow or a link from uh, delta posterior to 
as the posterior, which is in the environment, uh, delta moderate uh, S in the next step through B matrix uh, modulation. Uh, in this particular uh, Bayesian engine, uh, which formally correspond to canonical neural network, uh, we we don't consider that. Uh, it, it is correspond to uh, an absence of the uh, projection from output layer to the the uh, middle the middle layer. Okay. Let's. This is from the uh, 2020 paper, but it shows the neural network architecture, the two layer architecture. So could you um, restate the top and the bottom of figure two in the 22 paper and connect it to why it's important that you're studying two layer neural network models? Uh, I miss you. Oh, yeah. Can you c just connect um, the uh, asymmetry between the top and the bottom on figure two with the two layer neural network architecture? You said that the asymmetry, there's no direct link between. Uh -oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, this this is another story. So in the the previous paper, in the previous paper, so there is only an um, output layer or or the perceptual layer, because uh, we, we basically consider a single layer feed forward network. So. My apologies for for some confusion about the 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 network architecture in the two thousand twenty paper. So now, uh, upper part of this network architecture correspond to environmental generative process, and only a lower part correspond to a uh, single layer, single feed forward neural network architecture. So now. Uh, this part is identical to a map from O to S posterior in the 2022 papers. Ah. Okay. So, on the top of figure two is the actual generative process. Yeah. It's the true structure of causation in the environment, which is to say that actions, delta, mm. actually influence how states change through time via B delta. Right. The generative process through the A matrix emits observations, sequences of observations. And here on the bottom with a mirrored structure is the generative model of the mm. entity. So what's the relevance of the arrows and the more forney factor graph structure on the bottom? The arrow uh, indicates the, the, the influence or so it's a it's a flow of the the information in the sense that uh, to calculate uh, as in the step two we use the information of uh, step two observation and step one uh, posterior expectation about hidden state. So those two determine the S S two's uh, expectation. Uh, usually in the graph, uh, we consider uh, uh, a retrospective uh, arrow 
So in the sense that uh, S3 also uh, affect the S2 inference, but uh, this is correspond to a Bayesian smooth uh, in the sense that uh, we, we update every time step uh, uh, simultaneously to better uh, inference. However, what we consider here is a more uh, uh, filtering approach in the sense that for each step we compute the latest hidden state and then uh, we don't change uh, any other uh, states in the past. So that's why we don't uh, consider the arrow from future to the past. Awesome. Yeah, just to highlight that, in the Bayesian smoothing approach, it's kind of like fitting a spline because it takes the whole time series and it fits the smoothest possible line or the line whose smoothness is on the AIC, BIC frontier. But here on the bottom with the almost pseudocode implementation provided by the Forney factor graph, which was demonstrated to be equivalent with the Bayesian graph in the 2017 work with Friston, Parr, and DeVries. This architecture is reflecting a filtering scheme like a Kalman filter or just generalized Bayesian filtering through time where estimates are being carried forward and changed time point to time point such that the decision rules or the updates perhaps more accurately are defined between time points and the total time series does not have to be loaded into memory or remembered at once and then the bayesian filtering approach has the asymmetry with a different consideration of action so why again is it that action is considered differently in the Bayesian filtering approach on the bottom of the generative model than the consideration of action in the generative process? Uh, this that, that correspond to uh, lack, lack of connection from Y to X in the, the figure one or Probably a figure four is helpful to the that relationship. You so uh, or or yeah, this is a an example of network architecture comprising uh, input layer, middle layer, and output layer. What we consider is a information flow from uh, sensory to middle layer and middle layer have a self connection, so recurrent connection and the middle layer project to output layer. So uh, there is no connection from uh, all uh, output layer to middle layer, right? Uh, so that, that's why we don't uh, consider the, the link from uh, delta in the bottom layer of the figure to two uh, S uh, posterior. So this is different from true generative process in the environment. This is a, a kind of simplification. So because our purpose is uh, identifying the, the plausible Bayesian model which correspond to this this type of three neural network, canonical network. So in, in other words, uh, this canonical neural network uh, use uh, an approximation about that point or uh, yeah, use the uh, limited limited form of um, uh, POM DP scheme. Thanks. So could you describe 
W, V, K, and gamma? Just what is the biological or functional interpretation of those variables? Uh, and what, what brain regions or what processes or pathologies do they map to? Okay. So uh, basically, W, V, K are synaptic strengths uh, in the form of uh, matrices. And uh, uh, their difference uh, uh, so they, they represent uh, an optic connection in the different layer or different uh, architecture in the sense that uh, W means a forward connectivity from sensory layer to middle layer. K correspond to recurrent network, recurrent connectivity, and V correspond to uh, projection from middle layer to output layer. So in this paper, we don't discuss the uh, relation to brain anatomy in detail, but uh, one may uh, be, well, one can consider an analogy, for example, say X correspond to uh, the cerebral cortex activity and Y why, for example, correspond to cerebrum in the sense that it 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 determines the 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 action the action. So it it is considered that uh, in the cerebrum there is a signal that uh, represent a choice decision. For example, go decision or no go decision made in a cerebrum. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, analogous to uh, this this particular architecture. On the other hand, in the cerebral, uh, sorry, in the cerebral cortex, uh, we uh, compute the the sensory information to to, to generate some so inference, prediction, and uh, perhaps planning, so on, which which is computed. Uh, by this recurrent network uh, in this particular modeling. Although we don't uh, separate brain reason uh, in detail, but uh, this recurrent network is uh, sufficient uh, to, to uh, it, it, this class of recurrent network is sufficient to characterize any type of you know, architectures uh, in the sense that we, we can, we can yeah, design any uh, you know, higher car or so inter so mutually connected uh, architecture using a generic class of recurrent network by by changing weight weight matrices. Awesome. So the middle layer we can think of as like the cognitive stuff. It's mm. the internal states when we talk about perception, cognition, action in the ACTINF scheme, or even in the sandwich model of cognition, perception, oh. cognition, action. So W is describing how those sensory inputs, either in one step or composably in multiple steps, become processed to these X representations of hidden external causes, mm. inferred external states. And so these are the states that have that sigma relationship and a generalized synchrony with external states. The sigma right. and the generalized synchrony are not discussed in, in your paper, but um, it connects to other work. And mm. the recurrent connections are facilitating attention or waiting of the stimuli. This is the recurrent learning loop and the relationship of the A between observations and hidden state estimates. And then a different kind of modulation comes into play between the hidden state estimate of the internal state 
and the action selection. So what is gamma corresponding to and why is the gamma modulation between layers two and three differing functionally from the K synaptic modulation of one and two? Yeah, so K matrix uh, basically for formally correspond to B matrix in the Bayesian progression. So we propagate the information of, about the predict prediction, right? Our our knowledge or our expectation about the 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 next uh, state uh, based on the previous state. On the other hand, uh, law of gamma is quite different uh, from such a computation. Gamma basically means uh, a risk factor, risk, risk function, which is uh, yeah. In principle, we can we can use arbitrary risk function. So this is a part of generative model we designed, and the role of risk function in generative model formulation is a alternation of form of generative model uh, depending on the that value of uh, gamma, which enables a. Uh, 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 post predictive or retrospective uh, modulation of uh, the evaluation of past decisions uh, given an outcome uh, in the future. Uh, in terms of neural network, uh, of course, it corresponds to some neural modulation. For example, dopaminergic modulation is famous in the literature, which modulates the, the activity and plasticity of uh, various uh, brain regions, but we particularly focus on uh, modulation, dopaminergic or any kind of neuromodulation of synaptic plasticity in the output layer, which may correspond to cerebrum. So you're in the cerebrum, uh, neural activity or plasticity modulated by dopaminergic uh, input from uh, uh, yeah in, uh, uh, it, it, it is uh, used as the, the optimization of uh, action uh, rule decision rule or uh, sometimes attention uh, uh, and various uh, uh, purpose. Awesome. Very interesting because in some previous papers and models that we've looked at, attention is dealt with as policy selection on mental states. So internal action selection is a, it's an action like variable describing attention and awareness and even metacognition. Right. And so that connects the role of dopamine in motor decision making seen in many dyskinesias, but also with the role of dopamine in seemingly non motor based decision making, like gambling or investing, where it doesn't seem to immediately translate to a given motor sequence. Mm -hmm. Yet it has analogous computational characteristics and the comorbidities and the side effects of different drugs that affect the dopamine neurophysiology are known to have carryover in terms of like the rigidity or excessivity of motor and decision making aspects. So it's like interesting that dopamine has long been understood to have that parallel role. Mm -hmm in attention as cognitive action and motor action. And that was established empirically through modifications of dopamine signaling right. and also had been modeled analogously with computational neuroscience. And this is providing, again, a slightly different interpretation of that 
very well studied dopaminergic modulation of attention and policy. Hmm. Yes. And in addition to that, I, I believe another important aspect is the modulation of synaptic plasticity by dopamine. Well, I can show you an Do you want to show something or? Yeah. Uh, can, can you can you see this this paper? Uh, I, I I sent you, you a link okay. in the chat. Or okay. if, if you can't, uh, I, I'll send you a PDF. Um, OK, let me see. I'll get it up now. All right, the paper is um, a critical time window for dopamine actions on the structural plasticity of dendritic spines from 2014 by Yagashita. Yeah. So what yeah. is interesting about this paper? Yeah, it basically explains uh, 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 modulation of plasticity by dopamine, which is common. Uh, but a uh, crucial point of this paper is that it shows that it proved that dopaminergic uh, input can can modulate the uh, hebian plasticity even after hebian plasticity is established so uh, this paper showed that they add dopaminergic input uh, for example two seconds after or uh, several seconds after the 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 heavy uh, plasticity is established, but such a uh, post hoc modulation, post hoc uh, uh, introduction of, of heavy, uh, dopaminergic input is sufficient to change the past plasticity, which may uh, be associated with the 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 post hoc uh, re reevaluation of our past decisions. So, but by decision making we of course change the plasticity uh, changes the weight matrix by through plasticity but to to evaluate the goodness or badness of our decision we need to see observe the, the future outcome right uh, which is propagated by for example dopamine and this paper nicely uh, show empirically that uh dopamine uh, actually uh, uh, can change the past uh this joint evaluation maybe after such a circuit level very a very local level microscopic level hmm. so there's a short term window, the critical time window that they're describing, but there's some window. Yeah, some window, yeah. By which dopamine, potentially unrelated to the initial heavy and plasticity event, right. where secondary dopamine signaling or not secondary, just after the initial fact, potentially of a different valence or the same valence can synergize or cancel the plasticity formed in the moment. Exactly. And this is not limited to dopamine, but other neuromodulator can also do this. Well, on one hand, how does this change our understanding of animal neurophysiology? 
And then I guess on the other hand, how does this influence how we would design sentient artifacts? Hmm. When uh, 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 the for for both uh, animals and uh, the sentient agent, uh, artificial agent, uh, and one one important message I believe is that so this tells us um possible simple architecture to make planning you know, uh, this is an association between past decision and future uh, reward or any risk factors uh, which is otherwise uh, computed by uh, computing forward prediction by by iterating some computation right I believe this is a usual way to 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 predict the future event and then Select uh, action, but uh, using this this uh, property, physiological property, uh, which is observed in uh, actual experiment, uh, we, we can design, we can or imagine other a simpler architecture to make a planning. So for both animal and uh, sen uh, synthetic. Bayesian agent, uh, it provides an, an alternative explanation about about the, the association between our past decision and the future risk and the optimization of our decision to maximize the reward or minimize the risk. Mm. Well, one interesting note is we spoke earlier about the difference between the Bayesian smoothing all at once mm. approach and yeah. the Bayesian filtering step-by-step -step approach. Right. Now, if one had infinite knowledge and computational resources, the Bayesian smoothing approach is the way to go. Like mm. you don't want the decision rule for investment. You want to look at the whole time series, past, present, and future, and know the best moments to have made the trades. I mean, there's mm. no comparison. You're going to do better with the Bayesian smoothing However, it's just implausible computationally and because it requires total memory of the past and knowledge of the future. So that's what motivates the development of Bayesian filtering approaches, which are tractable and calculable through time. Yet, with this time-delayed modulation, part of the Bayesian smoothing's strength comes back into play. It doesn't enable true anticipation of future states, but that's what the expected free energy does. Mm. However, the delayed neuromodulation allows for reconsideration of a window of past states. And so in that way, it corresponds to... Um, like a slightly deeper filter, not right. just a filter of a time step of one, but a filter of like a rolling window of five or with some decay. And you don't want that window to be too big because if the window were 10 minutes, then too many contrasting stimuli would get um, piled together. The dopamine level would just converge to a mean field average but there's some time decay or time constant on the post hoc modulation where that neuromodulatory signal is actually a parameter of interest. And that's not an infinitely long or infinitely short window, but it's some niche dependent amount of time. And that's a very interpretable and first principles interpretation of the computational role of neuromodulators in a way that is also consistent with all these other concordances we've been exploring. So it's quite an interesting connection back. I guess in our final minutes of this discussion, um, 
what are you... Well, maybe <laughs> go to the beginning at the end, which I meant to ask earlier, but it's a good way that we can sort of close today and look forward, which is how did you come to this line of research, specifically studying neural networks in this way um, with Carl Friston and your colleagues? Hmm. So, yes. So, well, hmm. so my, my interest was the, the characterization of a biological, biological network. So my, my first motivation is to make a biologically plausible uh, artificial intelligence, but to uh, achieve that, we need to know about biological brain or biological neural network. And then, so I, in the, in these several years, uh, we, I, I collaborated with the, the doctor, uh, uh, Professor Carl Christen, uh, to, to study about his theory, free energy principle of TV inference. And then what my, my question, uh, during that period was, so, is, is the free energy principle is uh, everything about the the you know biologically plausible neural network or is there any other another aspect uh, that can characterize uh, the biological neural network? So it, it is non-trivial. Uh, it was non-trivial. So that's why I I try to. So I tried to start from uh, uh, characterizing the neural network first. So our strategy is not not uh, not uh, not uh, not considering the way of implementing any Bayesian algorithm as the brain architecture. But uh, our my, my interest is rather characterization of a given biological network in terms of something, some other things. Uh, one possible way is, uh, of course, Bayesian inference, free energy principle, active inference. So that's why I first uh, start from characterizing biological network. And, uh, but uh, just, just uh, defining neural network uh, architecture is insufficient. It, it is uh, too. It, it is not tractable. It, it is far beyond the the, the computational tractability uh, as the you know, mathematical analysis. And we need some assumption or some 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 trick uh, to increase the tractability. And one one day I came up with an idea uh, that, uh, uh, that so in, in which we consider that both neural activity and plasticity follow the same cost function gradient. Uh, this is a very much an analogy with a, a physical system like a Lagrangian uh, formulation or Hamiltonian formulation. So usually we consider some energy landscape and uh, uh, design a uh, plausible uh, trajectory as the solution of some uh, principle of uh, uh, minimum action or least action. So uh, we Imagine that what if we apply such idea to uh, neural network, conventional neural, canonical neural network or biological neural network to, to characterize their uh, dynamics uh, in the, the first principle. <laughs> on a, that, that's the first 
motivation for us to step uh, to come up with this this framework. And finally, yeah, we we noticed that uh, it is not easy to connect the Newtonian dynamics with uh, this type of neural activity study because uh, neural activity equation not necessary to be a second order uh, differential equation, but uh, rather it is a first order. And uh, considering many things, then we we we. we it, yeah, finally, uh, use the a cost function uh, proposed in the papers, uh, which is not necessary have a formal uh, identity with the so called Lagrangian in the Newtonian uh, physics, but but it is rather plausible as the uh, rule or um, underlying mechanism uh, of the such a, such type of network. Awesome. Well, it has been quite an interesting dot one. I really appreciate everything you've shared today is there anything else you want to add at this point otherwise we'll talk again yeah that's, that's fine <laughs> i already speak a <laughs> lot thank you all right You're... talk to you later bye yeah thank you very much for a nice discussion yeah.